Amen. Dear God, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn about your word today. Lord, you reveal yourself to the brokenhearted. So today we implore you to reveal yourself to us so we can become smaller and you become bigger in us. You said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we long to gain your heavenly kingdom. We thirst to start living your word, your kingdom here on earth, so people can see you in us. Lord, you likened the kingdom of heaven to a child. Allow us to have a child's heart that loves purely, forgives easily, and lives your word truly. Work in us, through us, and with us, so people may glorify you and come to know you truly. We ask you to transform us by new ways of thinking so that we may be able to tell what is your good, acceptable, and perfect will. Lord, transform our will to align with yours. You have blessed us with so much beyond our needs. Forgive us for taking what you give us for granted and for always complaining instead of thanking you. Lord, grant us wisdom to speak and live through you and understand your holy word. Amen. 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 We ask you, Lord, to hear us when we cry out to you, saying, Abun Bishmayu, Bitkadesh Shmoh, Tithim El Kuthoh, Nehwe Subyonoh, Eikan Bishmayu Paro, Ablan Lahmut Sunkonan, Yomono, Shbuklan, Haubain, Wahtohain, Eikan of Hnan Shbak and Hayubain, Lot Alan Lesino, Erofasol and Bijo, Metu Dilohim El Kuthoh, Hiruch Patolo, Lamolmin. I mean, before I give the floor to Eileen, I want to remind you and encourage you, if you did not register yet, to register for SYG US. SYG US, it is in July 13 till 16. I want to see all of you there. Okay? Love you. Eileen, go ahead. Baruch Morsena, Baruch Mor Abuna. I'm so excited to be back and just reading the word of God together. Last time we, we sat like this together, we were talking about God's holiness. And we came to the conclusion that the top priority of the church is understanding God's holiness. And we need to seek it above all things. So this is another kind of case study of God's holiness. We're going to continue on that because last time we just scratched the surface and we will continue just to scratch the surface. Even if you will spend your whole lifetime trying to understand it, you will not fully, you won't, because we can't comprehend all that God is, because God is infinite and we're finite, meaning we have limitations, he doesn't. So he's endless, limitless, and we are not, we're the opposite of that. So we have kind of a mindset that's limited. We won't be able to comprehend everything that God tries to reveal to us. But we try, we try to understand, and we, we should, like I said, seek it above all things. So today, this text, this uh, passage of scripture that we're going to read, it's probably the most challenging scripture you could ever read in the Bible. Many people, when they start reading the Bible, they, they're excited, and they start from the beginning. Because normally, when you start reading the Bible or any kind of book, you start at the beginning, right? And then you read chapter to chapter, and then you come to a passage like this, and many people get offended by this passage. They don't understand it, and they kind of object. They want to protest and say, this is not fair. So oftentimes, they will kind of close the Bible and put it on the shelf and let it collect dust because they can't handle what you just read. And sometimes people kind of skip the Old Testament because they don't like what they see there, and they rather spend time reading the New Testament. They like that God more. But we make a huge mistake when we skip the Old Testament because you won't understand the beginning. You won't understand the beginning of what, what the New Testament is about. It's a huge puzzle piece that we need to understand when Jesus was talking about the kingdom of heaven and the promises that he was talking about that, that he came and fulfilled. And they're all in the Old Testament. So we're going to jump into the text right away. So we're in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 to 10. And I would honestly recommend that if you have a piece of paper and a pen, that you would kind of jot down the verses that we are reading. I want you to, when we're done with this Bible study, that you would just go back to it. Go back to these verses that we are going to mention 
and read them all over again. Meditate on them and ask God to open your understanding. Maybe there's something else that God wants to reveal to you that won't be brought up at this one hour Bible study that we're having together. So yeah, I would highly recommend that. So I have Stephen, if you don't mind, if you can read that passage for us. Sure. <clears throat> Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So they, they set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio and sons of Abinadab drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the Ark of God. And Ahio went before the Ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of firwood, on harps, on string instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. Thank you, Stephen. If you guys notice, verse 8. I want you guys to pay attention to that verse. It says, David became angry. Do you understand that David was called a man after God's own heart? That's a compliment that God gave to him. Imagine God speaking highly of you. And do you see his reaction? David put God on trial. At this moment, David put God on trial and he found God guilty. His reaction says it all. But oftentimes, how often do we put God on trial? We kind of ask God when we see injustice in the world, we see earthquakes and innocent children and women and men, they die in these earthquakes. And we cry out and say, where are you, God? Why are you not intervening? Why are you not doing something? What are we doing? We're putting God on trial. We're actually saying that, God, you should have done something, but you're not doing something. Putting us in a place of acting like God, that we are saying, God, you should have done this and you should have done that. And oftentimes, this is something that we all, all fall short on. And we're going to continue. We're going to read. But I want you guys to pay attention on that. David's reaction. We will come back to that. But let's start from the beginning. So this Ark of the Covenant, this holy item, it was the most sacred relic at that time. Let's understand a little bit what is that. It was just a box. So Miriam, if you can just show image number one first. Yeah, so this is the Ark of the Covenant. God gave specific orders, specific details, how this Ark is supposed to be constructed. And he gives us these instructions in Exodus chapter 25. You can write this down because we're not going to uh, share it on the screen, but you're more than welcome to open your Bible while we're talking about this Ark of the Covenant. It's in Exodus chapter 25, verse 10 to 22. So God gives uh, instructions to Moses. He wants this box to be built. And he tells them, I want the size to be four feet by two and a half feet. And then he tells them, I want it to be overlaid, meaning covered in gold outside and inside. And then he tells them, I want you guys to put four rings. You guys see the rings where the poles are sliding in there. And then he tells them on top, I want two cherubims, two angels molded in gold on each end. And then he says, in the middle will be called the mercy seat. And he says, from the mercy seat, I will come and speak to you. That's where my presence will be, a symbol of my presence. So we understand that this item is very holy. It's like 
being almost in the presence of God when you have this, uh, this item. But we understand also that God's dwelling is in heaven. We know that he resides there. But for us to understand what this item in relations to God being living in heaven, the best way to explain it will be that this is God's footstool in heaven. If God lives in, in heaven, but this will be his footstool on earth, if I would say it like that. So when he tells them, and if you also, you can write down this verse too, it's in Numbers chapter four, verse 15. He tells them specifically, no one is allowed to touch this ark. If you do, you die. So no one is allowed to touch it. So everybody that's an Israelite, anyone that's a, a, a child of God or is part of God's people would have known this. But what happens here is that when we go back to the text that we read, 2 Samuel chapter 6, we see that David had good intentions. King David had just established his nation. He had made Jerusalem his capital. And he wanted to make it his spiritual capital too. He wanted to be the center, the spiritual center of everything. So he knows that this Ark of the Covenant needs to come back to Jerusalem and have a prominent place. Good intentions, right? But while he's doing this, there's an issue here. First of all, if you guys noticed, it says that they placed this Ark of the Covenant on an oxen cart. They placed it, if Miriam, you can show image number three. So this is the way they placed it. They, they moved it from where Uzzah's house was to get it to Jerusalem. This is how they carried this ark on an oxen cart. And on the way, because Jerusalem is kind of situated high up, so for the oxen to start to climb up this high position place, the oxen stumbles and the cart is about to tip over. And Uzzah reflex, he puts his hand out so the ark doesn't touch, touch the mud, the dirt. He was trying to do something good, but God doesn't see it as something good. God gave specific orders that this ark was not to be touched. So he strikes Uzzah dead right there. He doesn't spare one second. But why? It has to be something more to this. What I'm trying to say is that Uzzah made a big mistake thinking that his hands are cleaner than dirt. You see, God's commandments and his rules are not optional. We often make that mistake too, thinking that there are rules that we can choose to follow or not follow. But what you guys see here that God takes his rules very seriously and his commandments very ser seriously. And the thing is with Uzzah is that when he reached out in reflex to protect this ark, he doesn't understand that this ark wasn't supposed to be protected from the dirt or the filth, the mud. It was supposed to be protected from sinful hands because God is holy. He can't be in the presence of sin. So Uzzah does the mistake that he thinks that, like I said, that his hands are cleaner than the dirt. But if you guys think about this, has the dirt or mud, a created being, the way we are created beings, has it ever committed a sin? You see, God created mud to be mud. It's water mixed with dirt, right? It stays that way. It doesn't rebel against God and try to be something else. But we humans rebelled against God. So we are the sinful creatures, not the creation. So when Uzzah attempted to do this, he was breaking God's commandment. God would have rather that Ark of the Covenant hit the dirt. He would have been okay with that. I have a quote. I want us to uh, open that up. Miriam, quote number one, if you can... Um, and I want us to kind of discuss that. What do you guys think about this? It says, sins committed from a good and honest heart does not jeopardize a man's soul. What do you guys think about that? I would love to hear your feedback. If you don't understand the, the quote, if you don't understand the statement, please ask me and I'll explain it to you. If I would kind of like um, make it an easier way. Does good motives wash away sin? How about that? Does good motive wash away sin? What do you guys think? No. Why would you say that? What's your uh, take on that? You can 
have the right uh, intention subjectively, but objectively you're still committing a sin against God. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I think sin is sin regardless, whether done from a person with a good heart or not, because at the end of the day, you are constantly sinning and doesn't mean like, yeah, like, oh, I didn't intend to. Well, you still did it anyway. And like, if 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 it doesn't jeopardize a man's soul, then they're kind of like kind of contradicts why Jesus came and paid for our sins. Thank so if, it, if we're going to say a, a good, honest heart uh, washes away the sin, then that's saying Jesus died on the cross in vain. Thank you. Anyone else? You know, I have a problem here. It is not about a good, honest heart or not, but sinning one time, we are going, it is going to, to make us sinners. And it will be a habit. Mm -hmm. So here I have, I have a problem because, because we are, we are going to, of course, we all are sinners. But uh, but if we do it purposely, we start with we start unpurposely, and if we like it, and we start to justify ourselves, it will become a habit, and here we are going to lose our salvation. Yeah. Thank you, Sina. Do you think that this is an issue when it comes to the church? Of course, of course let me let me let me tell you something. We have also a comment. No, because uh, sin is a sin. Mm -hmm. So Nina Majun said uh, this. So going back to the, the question that I asked, do you think, is this a problem in the church amongst Christians that they are believing this lie that as long as you have good intention, it's okay? Do you think that's a problem in our church, in any church actually, in Christianity in general? What do you guys think? I think it can be. I think it can be. Uh, there's definitely some, I know a couple of people that think um, just because this person had a good heart on earth and like outrules uh, all the sin they've done. No, it, it really varies on how they live their life. You could be a, you could have a good heart and sin as much as you want, but if you're not repenting uh, consistently and you're not, uh trying to better yourself and asking god for forgiveness i feel like or not that i feel like it's you will not enter the kingdom of heaven because you did not repent you are not following uh the instructions that was given to us throughout the bible just because you had a good heart yeah but doesn't mean you're entering because anyone can have a good heart anyone can have a good heart so that so if we're gonna say that, then that means like a Muslim with a good heart could get in, which is completely wrong. Thank you, Andreas. So if you could have Azza come back to life and he would read this statement, he will say this is a lie because Azza had good intention. He was trying to protect that ark. So that's why he reached out and tried to grab hold of it before it would hit the dirt, before it would hit the ground. But God didn't say, oh, thank you, Azza. Thank you, Azza, for uh, not letting that ark. No. God struck him down. He killed him right there. God will not allow anyone to disrespect him. So when sometimes we see God's commandments and his rules, we have the wrong impression thinking that God is trying to kill our joy. Oftentimes, people don't want to become Christians because they're like, oh, you guys don't have fun. It's just a bunch of rules that you guys follow. Not understanding that those commandments and those rules are there for our protection. And that's where we get everything backwards. They're there for our protection. God is not trying to kill our joy. He's trying to protect us. He's trying to save us. And that's why he gives us these commandments and these rules. If we can open up again for uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, I want you guys to see something very interesting. Miriam, if you can open up. Thank you, Miriam. If you guys notice, when they're planning this, 
Look at verse one. David gathered all the choicy men of Israel, 30,000. Think about the parade here. They're so excited. Everybody's so hyped up because this is a big deal that this, this holy ark is going to come to Jerusalem. So imagine they're playing the music and they're all enjoying this, right? They're happy. They're joyful. But 30,000 people, not one person speaks up and says, hey, I remember in the Old Testament, in, in the commandments that God gave Moses, we were not supposed to bring this Ark of the Covenant in this way. We were not. Look at how we're supposed to bring it. If you can, uh, Miriam, if you can show uh, image number two. So according to God's instructions, this is the way that this Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be carried by priests on the poles, not touching this ark. And also this ark of the covenant is supposed to be covered. No one is allowed to look at it. So look at this. If 30,000 people, not one person speaks up that this is wrong. What does it teach us? That you know, when you see a crowd and everybody's going in the wrong direction, how easy it is for us to just follow the crowd. How easy is it? Not one of them, looked at the situation and said, we're breaking a commandment here, not one. Everybody was going along with it. And it shows us that oftentimes when we see a, a, a huge crowd doing something, we have the urge to just kind of follow. We don't wanna stand up for the truth and we don't wanna speak up and kind of say, no, that's not the way we're supposed to do it. God has says this, said this, or God has said that. No, we just follow along, we follow along the crowd. We see this, how many years ago was this situation? And it hasn't changed. We're still living the same way. We're still, you know, falling into that sin. Miriam, if you can open up uh, Psalms 145, verse 8. Thank you. So I have a uh, Miriam, if you can, you don't mind reading this. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Mm. So how do I reconcile this verse, okay, with God's dealing with Azza? It says, the Lord is gracious, full of compassion, and this part, slow to anger. I, I, it doesn't look like God was slow to anger when he struck Azza. It didn't take him very long, right, to get mad. So how do I reconcile this verse with what we just read, what happened to Azza? How do I reconcile those two? I mean, reading the text, you would probably say, no, it doesn't look like God was slow to anger. It looks like he got mad very quickly. Or is it like something that we're missing here? Let me tell you guys something else too that we're missing here. From Azza's home, where that Ark of the Covenant was, to get it to Jerusalem, we're talking about less than a one day's journey, less, if you're walking. So count how many hours from Azza's home to get it to Jerusalem. So for that many hours, God has just been watching them. He's very patient with them, right? He's watching them put this chest on the back of an, uh, can you open up that actually, Miriam, uh, image number three. So for, I don't know how many hours, he's just watching them. God gave strictly commandments how this ark is supposed to be carried. And they're coming into Jerusalem like this, right? And he's just watching them. He, he has patience. But now when we see Azza is about to touch the ark, God is like, I'm drawing the line here. Why does he draw the line here? He says, enough is enough. And he kills Azza. Why? Because think about how many hours he's been patient with them, them just disregarding God's commandment and just treating it as like it's optional. But then God says, okay, enough is enough. Why? Why does he get mad now when Azza touches the ark? What do you think would happen if God didn't strike Azza dead then? Do you think we, do you think they would have uh, said, okay, you know what? God is allowing us to touch this holy item Hey, this God that we're trying to worship that is so um, holy, he's not that bad. He's not that uh, serious. 
So let's relax a little bit here. Let's uh, dwell into the other sins also. What happens when a parent doesn't exercise their authority in the home? When let's say uh, a father and a mother gives a, um, a commandment in the home and says to their child, you have to be home at 10, 10 p.m. And the child says, okay, they leave the house and then they come back and it's 11 p.m. Now, if the mother and the father don't have a punishment and they kind of say, okay, it's okay. Now, do you think the child will stop at that? What do you think the next step will be for that child? If they see, oh, wow, I got away with this, breaking this uh, rule, that means I can break another and another and another and another. If God doesn't restrain and kind of put down his authority, we will be out of control. We don't stop at just one sin. We never do. We just continue and continue kind of testing the water and see how far we can go. Children are like that. We are like that. Adults are like that. Miriam, I have another uh, quote. Uh, number two, if you can pull that up. So it says, yes, God is loving and merciful, but he's also holy. And he defends his holiness with his power, bringing about his holy wrath. What do you guys think about that statement? And relations to what I just said about that God has to exercise his authority. If he doesn't, we will start stepping out of the boundary that we're supposed to be in. What do you guys, what do you guys comment on this statement? Do you guys understand the statement? Okay, no comments? Okay, so God, why does God have to defend his holiness? It kind of has to do a little bit what I just said before. Why does God have to defend his holiness? If God doesn't defend his holiness, do you think we would respect him naturally? Do you think we would reverence him as holy? Do you think that comes natural to us? We are disobedient creatures. We love to disobey. And God has to constantly restrain us. Like I said, we, we get out of hand if he doesn't restrain us. So even, imagine even like when he had this, this allowing this to happen. Think about this, like the, the patience and the mercy and the grace of God. If the queen of Elizabeth was still alive and she decides to come visit America and the president of the United States sends a pickup truck to the airport and tells Queen Elizabeth, jump up on the back of the pickup truck. We're gonna take you to the, we're gonna drive you to the White House. Would that be acceptable? Would the Queen of Elizabeth accept that? She wouldn't, right? So what would be the right way if you're gonna send something like in a form of a car to go and pick up Queen Elizabeth? You would send a limo, lim limo right? Because that's fitting for a queen. I mean, God is a king of the kings. So of course he's gonna get mad. And oftentimes when we read a text in the Bible, when we don't know all the details, it's easy for us to put God on trial and say, oh, that's not fair. Now you're a little bit too extreme here. I think you're a little bit too picky with your rules here. Did he really have to die? And what would God's answer be? When we disrespect him and we disrespect his holiness, what do you think God's answer is going to be? Any comments, any questions? Okay, let's continue. Let's talk about, uh, if you, Miriam, if you can go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Okay, so now we're coming to David's reaction. It's in verse 8, and it says, David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Azza, and he called the name of the place Perez Azza to this day. What is it that caused David to be angry? What do you guys think? Why do you think David got angry? Is it because David has a preset idea how God should act and how he should be? And when God steps out of this preset idea that we had, we don't like it. We kind of want to put God in a box and say, you're supposed to be like this. And when God breaks out of that box and says, I'm not like this, 
we get kind of mad and say, no, you're not allowed to. Well, you're not allowed to. You have to be what we think you should be. How often do we do that? Let me give you guys an example how that works. So I have a box here, right? Just a regular box, right? And then I have a couple Bible verses and statements that God makes and reveals and declares who he is in the Bible. So I know it's going to be backwards, but it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, God is love. Look what I'm doing right now. Yes, I love that. I want God to be love because I need him to love me at all times. So I'm going to put that in my box. I'm putting that in there. Next statement that God declares in his word, in his truth is, God is jealous. Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. Jealous sounds so negative. I don't know if that sounds good. Like we're not supposed to be jealous. So I don't think God should be jealous. So I'm not going to put this in my box. So I'm going to kind of disregard this statement that God makes. And then I have another one. God is merciful. Luke chapter six, verse 36. Yeah, I, I love this one because I want God to be merciful. Why? Because I make a lot of mistake and I want God to forgive me. So I'll put that in my box. I want God to be merciful. So I'll add that, right? And then we have God is consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. God is consuming fire. I don't know if I like that. That means I can get burned. Fire burns you. No, I don't think I like that. So I'm going to disregard that. This is something God declares in his word, right? But I'm not going to accept that. And then we have the last one. God is just, meaning God is fair. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Yeah, I want God to punish all the wicked people. I want God to punish all the bad people. So yeah, I want God to be just. But wait a minute. Sometimes I'm bad. So do I want him to punish me too then? I don't know. What should I don't know. No, I don't know. I'm not liking that one that much. Yeah, I want him to punish the, the really bad people. But yes, I am bad sometimes too. So I don't think I want God to be just and fair all the time. So I'm not going to include that in my box. What did I just do right now? I have a box. And I have the statements that I accept. What did I just do, do you think? I just created my own God. A God that's cre cre catered to what I, what my preference is. And that's what David does. The man after God's own heart gets mad at God, puts God on trial and say, God, you made a mistake here. That's what David's reaction is saying. That's what it's implying. And we do the same thing. When we try to put God in a box and say, stay there, you should only be this. Don't be anything else. So there's a beautiful verse. It's in Exodus chapter three, verse 14. And I have Gabriel, Gabriel, you're reading that. Baruch Mor said no. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So Gabriel just read something here. You know, when God spoke to Moses through a burning bush, okay? And he tells Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And then Moses tells God, what should I tell the Israelites? Who should I tell them that's, what is your name? And look at what God, the name that he cleared. He said, he said I am who I am. More than a name, it's a statement. I am who I am. It's almost like God is saying, I'm going to be wherever I'm going to be. I'm not going to be this God that you have created in this box. You can't put me in a box. That's what he's saying. Any comments, any questions so far? If not, we'll move forward. Uh, let's go to uh, First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 11 and 15. Actually, first, sorry, do uh, Miriam, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, so when David realized what happens like at this parade, right, and he gets mad at God, he kind of says, okay, how can we bring this Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem? How? So he kind of says, I don't want this, this item even close to me. So he says, go put it at Obed Edom's home. 
let it stay there for now. And look what he finds out. He finds out something. And I have Megan, if you don't mind reading that. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obededom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obededom to the city of David with gladness. Mm. So the God that judges is also the God that blesses. So David finds out that while this ark of the covenant, this holy item, the sacred item, while it's in the home of Odeb Edom, his household gets blessed and everything, everything, probably his cattle, his fields, his, his crops is probably growing more like abundantly, right? And David is trying to figure out, he's okay, there's something wrong with us then, not this ark, because look what happens when it's in this person's home. His home is blessed. We got cursed. But his home is blessed. So Miriam, if you can open up uh, the quote, number three. Okay, so it says, you can only know the blessing of God if you come to him in the way that he has prescribed. What does this mean? I'll give you guys a chance to kind of explain it to me. Can I answer this one, please? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so according to this, you can only know the blessing of God if you come to him in a way that he prescribed. I think it means like to follow like his guidelines, like to follow the same footsteps that he, um, uh, that he uh, went through when he was on this earth. Like, for example, like if he told me, Oh, you have to read the Bible every day. Uh, like if he read the Bible every day, I would have to read the Bible every day as well. If he fasted for 40 days, I would have to 40 days as well. Basically, and, and also, by the way, if you, if you want to correct me on this, you can correct me and anybody can correct me, by the way. But, uh, but yeah, this is like, to me, I feel like this is something that we have to follow, uh, follow him, like follow the same footsteps that he went through and like what he wants from us, basically. Daudi. Thank you. You know, when you said following the footstep of Jesus Christ while he was here on earth, do you know a uh, um, big mark of his walk on earth was his obedience to the father, his obedience to the father. That's what it was all about. Obedience unto death. He obeyed God, the father, till he came even to the cross. Until, until death, right? Now, let's take us for an example. I want God's blessing, but for me to receive God's blessing, God has a condition on that blessing. You have to obey him. If you don't obey him, you'll miss out on that blessing. Because we saw that with David, because David disobeyed God. He didn't follow the guideline how to bring this Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He got cursed because of that. He missed out on the blessing. But Odom Edom's home is blessed. So we see there that even let's say we'll talk about this. Like you guys heard this uh, statement many times by many people. Why is Jesus the only way? Why is Jesus the only way to receive salvation? A lot of people are saying that's too exclusive. We don't like that. He should open the door for others too. It, it shouldn't be just through him. Now, what do you answer to that? If a Muslim comes and says, I'm a good person, I do charity, I help my neighbors, I serve my, my community, and I do all these things, why I have to go through Jesus? It has to do with this, exactly this, what the statement is. What would you answer them? If I'm being quite frank here, and I hope I'm not uh, interrupting anyone, I would honestly, I would ask them, uh in the same manner as well like if i do everything right if i do charity i'm a good person good heart and everything like that but i'm not a muslim does that mean i go to your heaven as well certainly not so i feel like it falls under the same aspect for us you could do all these good things with good intentions but if you're not if you do not believe that jesus is your lord and savior and he died for you 
and paid for your sins. And you're not attempting, again, you're not attempting to follow his word. There is no way you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Even today, uh, as uh, Sayyidina read today, he said, how hard is it for it for a rich man to get into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle? So you could have all these things, do all these things, pay. You could be the best person on earth. But if you do not have the love of God in your heart and you're not following his commandments, there's absolutely no way you can ever get into heaven. Aileen, yes, uh, here I have a question. I'm your bishop, but I'm, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it a tricky question? <laughs> uh, don't use my words, please. Uh, here... I'm a little bit confused. Of course, I believe and I agree and I'm fully convinced that Jesus is the only way. But how can we uh, interpret or understand Romans when St. Paul says, for those who didn't have the chance to get to know Jesus, they are going to be judged according to, the, to their natural law. Hmm. What do you think? That's such a good question. It says, yeah, we will, they will be judged by their, what they know, their conscience, right? So God gave a conscience. He placed in every human being, believers and non-believers. We all have that, right? But now the problem is, I'm still a little bit like iffy with that because God says we only have a chance while we're on earth. And he says that for him to return, right? For him to come back to his second coming, the word of God, the invitation has to be sent out to everybody. No one can plead innocence. Even if we read in Romans chapter one, when God, when God says, man, you're, you're inexcusable because I have placed my fingerprints in creation declaring who I am. So he says, you are without excuse. He says, there should have been a way for you to have found out who I am. He says, there's no way you could have said, because we all have... Um, I'm gonna say this, we all also are have a hole in our heart, right? And we all have this, because I know how I came to know God, asking the question, why am I on earth and why do I live? I'm not the only one that's gonna ask this question. Every human being is gonna ask this question. And why is the reason why we ask that question? Because we are supposed to look at creation and see how complex it is. Look at our body and our DNA and see there's a creator behind this. Okay, now what's the next step that I'm supposed to take? I'm supposed to go and search trying to find out who this creator is. So he says, I, I planted my evidence everywhere. So how do we explain that then? He says, You're, you are without excuse. You can't say, I didn't know. I didn't know there was a creator. And I cannot say that the creator is God and that he sent his son. I can't, I can't use that as an excuse on judgment day. I agree, but for this reason, for this reason, and I usually, when I, I talk to somebody, uh, I will tell him or her, do your homework. Mm -hmm. You have the blessings of God. You are a Christian. You know him. Do your, work and be, be, do your homework and be ready. Yeah. And let other things to God. Yes. You know, I have, I have a funny... A funny example about uh, your quote here, you can only know the blessing of God if you come to him in the way that he has prescribed. And please, Yanni, accept my apology to, to compare God to, to your new car. You are not going to get everything out of your car unless you approach it and read the manual and to get to know everything about your car. And then you will, you'll have all its power. And the same is valid, even though I don't like to compare God to, to anything else because God is always on top. But we cannot get the blessing unless we, we get to know him and we get to be closer to him and we get to need to, to always be, be under his hands blessing us. So we, ha we have to know him the most to, to get all the blessings. Thank you, Sina. 
You know, there's a good example in the Bible. I know everybody knows the story about Abraham. God calls Abraham out of Ur, okay? And he tells them, you're supposed to walk to the promised land, Canaan. But he doesn't give him directions really how to get there. All he's telling him, it says, pick up your belongings, take your family, pack your bags, and you're going to go and walk now towards this promised land, right? God tells him, Abraham, look at the stars in the sky. That's how great your nation will become. Your descendants will be like the stars in the sky. It's a promise that God is telling Abraham. And then he tells him, like the sand, that's how big your nation is going to be, right? Your descendants. And he says, through you, I will, I will place in that seed the Redeemer, the Messiah. That's the promise, right? A blessing. But how did Abraham get that blessing? If Abraham would have said, no, thank you, God, I'm staying here in Ur, it's too difficult the journey, it's not safe, and I'm comfortable here, would he have received the blessing? He wouldn't have, right? He would have forfeited that blessing. So every time God is offering us something, there's a condition to that, always, the obedience part. If you don't obey, he, he'll, he'll not, he's not going to give you that blessing. And that goes for salvation too. He says, I think it's in 1 John. I don't know exactly where in 1 John, but he says, if you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. It goes hand in hand. But let's go back to um, the text again. How do you guys think that Azza ended up in this situation when he started to disregard God's holy item as not holy. You could easily argue and say, but it was just a reflex. But I'm not going to buy that. How come Azza ended up in this situation that it costed his life? There's another clue there, that another puzzle piece that you don't know in the text. We haven't talked about it yet. Do you know that the Ark of the Covenant was in Azza's home for 20 years? Almost 20 years. So imagine now the first day when this holy item is coming into his home, the excitement, the reverence, the respect, and the, you know, the, the excitement in the home that this is going to be in our home, in our home. That's the first day. Now, week pass, year pass. We talk about 20 years that that item is collecting dust, right? Do you think he's still looking at that item as in reverence, reverence and he's, He's admiring it, or is it starting to become not so special anymore? Did he get too accustomed to this item, this holy relic in his home? Is that the cause to, he got careless with it? That he was like, yeah, it's been in my home for 20 years. No problem. I can touch it. Now, bring that back to our life. We talked about this also last time we, we spoke about God's holiness, that we as Christians being born into this faith, that we get very comfortable and custom to our church, the sacraments, every part that is holy, desecrated, set apart. We don't see it as special anymore because we've been around it for so long. Any comments, any questions about that? If not, we'll move forward. I want us to see now how David is going to make it right. I guess he went back and kind of studied the Old Testament, studied the, the commandment that God had given Moses. And he's like, we're going to do this right now. If Miriam, you can open up 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 11 to 15. And I have Leah reading that. Oh. Sure. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests and for the Levites, for Uriel as Isaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab. He said to them, you are the heads of the father's houses of the, Le of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Miriam, open up, like, put up the, share the image of number two again, please. 
So we see that David gets it right now. He puts the blame on himself. Do you guys remember when I said in verse 8 of 2 Samuel chapter 6, David had put God on trial and said, God, you made a mistake here killing this person that's trying to do something good in your name. And now he put himself on trial. I guess David had some time to think about this because when this Ark of the Covenant ended up now in Obed-Edom's home, it's there for three months. So David has three months to think about what went wrong. And then he figures out what he did wrong. He was supposed to bring it like this to Jerusalem. So he corrects himself, gathers all the priests, and now they do it the right way. And what happens when we do things the right way? We will experience God's blessing. And that's what happened. David experienced God's blessing. No one died. No one died. Everything went smoothly. There's a verse. It's in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 6. I'm going to just read it for you guys, but I, I think you guys should kind of like jot it down and go back to this verse. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 6, it says, do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them. And I love this part. Do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. God is saying, do not provoke me to anger. I will harm you if you provoke me to anger. If we defy God and we just disregard his commandments he will punish us there's no question about that Uzzah is an example of that but you will find in the Bible many times we even find it in the New Testament we see a part where after Jesus resurrection all the believer, believers came together they sold their belongings and they shared what they had and they would read the, the scriptures, they would sing psalms, and they would just be in prayer together, like a little colony, right? And then they would go and spread the word. But two people, a husband and a wife, they decide to sell their home, okay? And they come to Peter and say, we sold our home, and this is the money that we have, okay? But they lied to Peter. Some of the money, they hid it, because they were thinking, if this doesn't work out with these Christians, we have something to fall back on. But the problem is you can't lie to God and you cannot lie to the Holy Spirit. So right there, the husband and the wife get cursed. So God puts a judgment on them and they die. God doesn't waste one second of their disobedience. So it's not just in the Old Testament. We see God will judge us in the New Testament too. Any comments, any questions? Of course, here, my dear friend, Meaning, dying the Old Testament here, we can refer to it to it in the New Testament that sin will separate us from God, so we are going to die spiritually. And and of course, we, this is exactly what we keep repeating when we we speak about uh, any dead, dead dead man or woman uh, when we do our eulogy that no, we don't fear. We don't fear uh, the physical dying. We 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 fear we fear the the spiritual death. So it is very important to to pay attention to that, uh, my friends. That now now it is always an acceptable time to repent. We have we have all the sufficient time to repent. But the problem, we don't know when we are going to die physically. And sin will separate us from God. And that's me, we are not going to be, to be in communion with him. Not being in communion with him, that's me, we are, going to, we are not going to be in his kingdom. So please think about it like that. Of course, what we are hearing now is very important, but uh, uh, it referred to, to the spiritual also, death in New Testament. Sin will separate us from God. God does not like sin. He wants us to be holy. Thank you, Elena, and thank you for allowing me to, 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 to add something. Thank you. Yeah, you should always talk. Just talk. Just interrupt me every second. I love to hear you. Thank, thank you. you. So if I would give an example of comparing, you know, God's holiness for something that we can understand better, you know, Let's talk about the sun, you know, the sun that we have, that the sun is good, 
we need it to survive on this planet. Without the sun, we will all wither and die, right? Now, we know that the sun is good, but the sun is also dangerous. If we don't respect the sun and we kind of treat it carelessly, meaning if I approach the sun too close, what happens to me? I will become a crispy thing, right? I will start to burn up. I need it, but I need to also be careful how I approach the sun. Even let's say you, you're not using sun protection, right? And then you're just at the beach, let's say, for example, and you are there for hours and you're careless, you're re reckless, right? And then you're under the sun. And then what happens to you? You, you burn. And it can go even so far that it can become life-threatening. God is the same way. We need to respect him the same way you would respect the sun, right? And approach it in a respectful way. It's the same way. God is good, but he's also holy. I always wanted to get a t-shirt. I, I Sometimes it bothers me when people say, you know, God is love, God is love. It doesn't bother me. He is love. But I wish we could add a, another addition to that. God is love, but God is also holy. Just to make people think a little bit. What does that mean? They kind of want to just have God to be love and they don't want to have God being holy. Any questions, any comments? I have a verse otherwise. Okay, Miriam, open up please Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. And I have Trina. Park Mar Sayedna. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Hmm. Yeah, so we live in a fallen world, okay? We are fallen creatures. Things don't always, what it seems to be is not always the truth, okay? So what you perceive to be, oh, I'm doing it, I have good intention, I'm doing it for a good cause. What seems good to you might not seem good to God. We see that with example with David and Uzza. What seemed good to them wasn't good to God. I know, I think we're like past my the time, right? Did I pass it? Yes. Okay, I'm done. That was the last verse. No, no, you can't stay. No, no problem. We, are, we love uh, your Bible study. Yeah, so I think you guys want to do questions after? Please. Okay. But you know, I want to, you know, always uh, good intention is a tricky word here because all of us in our societies, we try to to justify ourselves and to justify others. We we keep saying that at least he has a good intention. A sin is is sin. Mm -hmm. So we have to know that sin is sin, and we have to be careful in our relation. Yes, God is love, but He is just also. He is holy. He is complete. You know, has all features. He is not only love. Love, but he is just and he is holy. And, and now, now he is giving us the time for repentance. Mm -hmm. he, he, he saved all of us. This is, we know it for sure, but we have to, to, to as, as Sayyidina, as Sayyidina Basil was telling us, we have to acquire uh, the grace. We have to, to gain it. So by our our work too. Do you have any question to Eileen? Any comment? Go ahead. Barak Mora Bona. Sayyidna Subkono. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, I was just think, commenting really. Um I like the um Bible study today, tonight. Um, and I'm thinking about sin. Sometimes it's not just an instant thing that you do. It can be the journey. So all the steps that got you to that point. So the example of that um, that you explained tonight, thinking about how you got to that point. And so if you think about all the things that influence you in your life, it can just shape you to the point where you're so vulnerable that you you sin like that so you, I guess it's about watching uh, you know watching yourself uh, making sure you're on the right journey um, that you've got the support um, and that you're feeding your mind and your your heart so you don't go down the 
I guess, the journey that gets you to that stage. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Sarah, are you from England? I'm from Australia. Three, wow. What, yeah. time is, what time is it now? Um, I'm in Washington, D.C. at the moment. You met me say you met me say yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is my problem. Yeah. Apology. That's okay. <laughs> That's your matter. Any other question? Uh I don't have a question. Uh I just have like a, a comment. Um right. uh, it's a good comment. So yeah. Um after uh, like hearing uh, uh, Elaine, is that how you say your name? Okay. Uh, after uh, hearing like your lecture about uh, about this topic, to me, like uh, uh, to me, it I saw it felt like it was a way of saying uh, start uh, start doing uh, start going into the right path instead of the wrong path because. Because who knows, like, you, you don't know uh, what might happen to you. Like, start doing the good thing. Like, read the Bible every day. Like, start doing, like, God's command, commandments on what he uh, told you to do. That's how I saw it, uh, uh, by the way. And it was very powerful. And it really, like, it, it really opened up my heart uh, to, like, and it also woke me up, too. And it was, like, wow, like. I really got to wake up and start focusing on what comes my way. Dodi, thank you. Dodi Frank. If they don't have questions, I have three questions that I want to ask you guys, like a challenge a little bit. But if they have questions, I'll, I'll hold my piece. Go ahead. Okay. Question number one. Why do people fall into this limiting belief? Like, how do we fall into this that we limit God? How do we fall into that? Can you say that one more time, please? The question. So I wish I had it on the screen that I could share it, but I don't. So why do people fall into this limiting belief that we limit God? That like, you know, when I explained about the box, how do we fall into that? That we create our own God, like that. Yeah, I, I can totally see why. Um, because we, we want to pick and choose um, what we want to follow. Um, and there's a lot of things that we don't want to follow. It's too difficult. It's a narrow path. Mm -hmm. And it's just you're going against the tide of the rest of the world. So you're basically like it's just too difficult. So you're choosing, you're choosing to just pick the good stuff that appear good to you. Mm -hmm. Because usually we pick and choose, and we try to 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 please ourselves. So we wanna wanna have what what it would please us. So if I would answer that question, it would be uh, molding an infinite God into a form of human understanding. If we talked about God being no limits, right? And for me to comprehend it, I kind of pull God down to my level, okay? And it's okay, I can deal with this God. But when God is out of this, it, it frightens me. I get scared. It's like, I can't deal with a God like this. You remember David, he said, okay, I can't deal with this holy ark. Now, God, you went a little bit way out of my box. You dealt in a way that I wasn't ready for it. So David said, I don't want this box here. I can't handle it. We do the same thing. We want God to become so approachable that we create exactly like that. We mold them into a little place, like a little ball like that. I'm like, okay, I can hold this. This I can deal with. And that's the problem. Question number two, what prevents me from knowing God as he is? What prevents, that's a question you should meditate on for yourself. If I would ask you, what, what holds you back from knowing God as he is? What would you answer? I, th I think my response would be distractions. I think it would be distractions because if there's something that distracts me from God, it'll be like, 
how can I explain it? it it'll be basically like, I don't want to use the word brainwash because like we, uh, because, but I, I can say like misunderstood. You know, Sarah said something, okay. And it has to do with that. We are self-centered creatures. You know, the, the word sin, okay. Three letters, right? What's the middle? I don't want to put my finger up, but what's the middle letter in the word sin? You. I, yes, I. It's always about us. So when what prevents me from knowing God as he is, Sarah said, we cherry pick because we want to create something that we're comfortable with, that's going to fit our schedule, my plans, my ambitions, and what, I don't want God to come in, in between that. I don't want God to interfere or control my desires and my plan or goals that I have in life. So that's what stands in the way from us knowing God as he is. Question, the last question. Do I know who God is or do I deal with him based on what I think he should be? Again, do I know who God is or do I deal with him based on what, what I think he should be? What would you guys answer to that? no one has an answer to that, I'll just read off the notes here. It says, when we allow our beliefs about God to be what we want, based on our own preference rather than by God himself, we transform the perfect one who sits on the throne into something that reflects our own brokenness. Any comments, any questions about that? I'm kind of done after that. Eileen? Yes. I think it's because we don't spend enough time with him that we start to deal with him based on what we think he should be. So um, I think all of your questions are kind of tied together. But one thing that I wrote down that I think addresses most of them is that we don't fear God. Mm -hmm. And if we did, we don't anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it carries on in the way that we well, it's represented in the way that we carry ourselves in our own lives. We don't have this healthy fear where we we um, we check ourselves constantly and see if we're on top of our own holiness um, and our own relationship with him. And that's when we start to permit our sin or we forget to repent or we think that we don't need to, right? So all of those things kind of come together and subconsciously we're creating this image of God, like he's all loving and um, all forgiving and he's going to forgive me. I don't have to do X, Y, and Z, right. To, to gain his love. It almost feels like we're just given it inherently. And this is all wrong, right? We have the choice to have chosen him. And I think we have the choice to continue to follow him. So we should fear him in a healthy way. I love your answer, Megan. So Think about this. You know, Megan just said something. She touched upon it. She says, we need to spend time more in the scripture, right? That's what you meant, right? Do you know what happens when we spend time in the scripture? God challenges our God that we have created. Because every time you open up the scripture, you're going to find out who the real God is because he reveals himself there. So whatever preset idea you have of God, God is going to break that apart. He kind of takes a sledgehammer and starts shattering everything that you have decided that this God should be. And he's saying, no, I'm challenging this God that you have created. And now what do we do then? Am I going to embrace it? And I'm going to embrace God exactly the way he is. And I'm going to accept it. Because when I do that, I discover that the kingdom of God has come upon me. I receive life when I do that. But if I continue just to worship this God that I have created, I'm on a dangerous path. And that path leads to eternal separation, like Sayyidina said, from God. Um, yeah, just, I just want to leave a comment sort of piggybacking off of what Megan and, and you just said. Uh, I remember reading something recently. Someone said that they were in the middle of praying at night and they were doing the part of their prayer where they're repenting. They're going over the sins they committed that day and they're kind of doing it in like a nonchalant way, just 
oh, forgive me for lying at this moment. Forgive me for doing this and that. And then halfway through, they kind of just stopped and paused. They were like, what am I doing? <clears throat> I'm not taking God seriously enough. That's the real sin here. All of these little sins are just like, I'm going to repeat them again tomorrow at this point because I'm not taking them seriously. And every night I just recycle the same thing. Oh, forgive me for this. Forgive me for that. I'm going to do it again tomorrow, but like, forgive me for it anyway. Um, and then he kind of had like that revelation of like, these are not like, these are sins, but my biggest sin right now is I'm not taking God seriously enough. I'm just letting this pass by. Like it doesn't mean anything. And I'm just checking in my receipt at the end of the day. So that that's something to think about as well. That kind of goes with all of this. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I just want to add something here. Um, I think one of the biggest problems that we are facing today, especially in the 21st century, is, you know, before we go through the Holy Scriptures, we see how God used to be in the middle. And until now, whenever I read the Holy, God, the Holy Gospels, the Old Testament, the New Testament, it's all about God is in the center. Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to what Elim mentioned in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, when God appeared to Moses, mm -hmm. he told him, I am who I am. And by the way, if you go back to the, like the Greek, uh, to the original languages, you will see how Jesus Christ used the same words in the New Testament, especially in the Holy Gospel of St. John, when he said, I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am, I am, I am. So God's proving something. Jesus Christ is proving something. He's proving that he's the same God from the beginning. And he's the one who was in the Old Testament and he's in, now in the New Testament. And there are many, uh, you know, if you go through the Gospels, you can compare it with the Old Testament. You see how God is trying to prove something to all of us that he is the same one. He is in the center. When God gave the Ten Commandments, Moses went up to the mountain to take the Ten Commandments. And when you go to the Holy Gospel of St. Matthew, you see how God is on the mountain, the sermon on the mountain. Jesus Christ is giving his sermon to prove that he is the same God. But again, one of the biggest problems that we are facing today, especially in the 21st century, is what the human being is trying to do is he's trying to be, or we are trying to be in the center. Before, when we had the commandments of God, everything was based on the commandments. So if you want to know if you that you're following God or if you're not following God, you can compare what you're doing, what you're saying with what we have in the, in the commandments of God, in the book of the Deuteronomy and other, other commandments. What we have today is we're trying to say, no, I will be in the center and I will base everything on what I want. That's why I'm going back to Satan's question when he asked about, about the verse in the Romans. What about those people who did not hear about God? There are people today who are saying that, okay, even if you are not Christian, if you're not believing in Christ, uh, you can be saved. And Thomas Aquinas talks about it in his theology when he says that uh, we have our conscience. And that's what was in the beginning. Because if you go back to the Old Testament, you see how from Adam and Eve until Moses, we didn't have commandments. We have we had our conscience. That's why when Cain killed Abel, he knew that he did something wrong because his conscience told him that you did something against God's will. And that was a big question, especially when they discovered America. Uh, they said, what about those people who lived for like 14 centuries and they did not hear about God? God was working through their conscience. But again, what Thomas Aquinas is saying is today, our conscience is not enough. In the, in the New Testament, especially for those who know God, who know the commandments of Jesus Christ, we need to follow the commandments of God. We need to believe, to accept Christ as we have it in the Holy Gospels. That's why it's very important to 
to believe in what we received from the gospels and from the church tradition um, in our church orthodox tradition um, we have many church fathers who talked about salvation and what we should do to be saved there are steps that we need to follow to be saved and today again going back to the 21st century when we hear different things uh, different teachings is because the human being started his own commandments. Like today, when we talk about the Ten Commandments, God said, do not kill. But today, when we talk about abortion, it is killing and it is accepted. When we talk about other topics, the society is ac accepting many things against God's will. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing today. So we always need to return to what Jesus said in the Holy Gospels. Um, he is the way, he is the right, he is the bread of life. Um, he is everything and all our life should be based on his teaching and what we have in the Holy Gospels. Um, thank you, Sayyidna. Oh dear, Buna. Are you going to conduct our Bible study next week? Yes, yes. And I will share the topic with, uh, with Nehreen. Thank you. Inshallah soon. Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy to be gathered around the word of God, but we have been here for one hour and a half. So it's about to, uh, to end our uh, meeting. Uh, I want to give you a home a homework. Can I? Try to talk to your friends not only from New Jersey or Michigan, or I don't know where, try to invite people to come and see, to come and see him. This is a very nice opportunity to be gathered together, to share, to share in his Bible, to get to know him more and better. So try, don't be shy to talk about your belief, and to talk about God and invite your friends to come and see. By the way, I don't care. Uh, uh, when I give, I don't I don't care about number. Any when I give Bible study for the ladies, I give I give Bible study for for only seven or eight. Numbers are is not very important, but what I'm talking about is to try to to attract more people to be uh, close to God, closer to God. Okay? Can we pray over this uh, intention? And by the way, it's a good intention. <laughs> Who's going to uh, to end our meeting uh, with a short prayer? Yes. I heard somebody opening his mic. Nobody? Elin? Are you tired? You want me to end it? Yalla. Okay. You're gonna end it, or yes. yes. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. And we ask you to bless all of us, to bless this group, and to help us, Lord, as we heard today during our Bible study, to help us, Lord, to to be closer to you, to get to know you as we have to, by reading your holy Bible, by receiving your holy sacraments, by being in your house. And by doing so, I'm sure we are going to know you better. And by knowing you, we are, we are going to shine. We are going to be little Christ, going around and converting people to your salvation. Lord, we ask you this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, and we ask you to hear us when we lift up our hand and say, Abun Bishmayu, Nitqada Shishmukh, Tithi Melkuthukh, Nehwa Subyonukh, I cannot be smile of barrow. 
هبلان لحم تصون قونان يومونو واشبق لان حوبين وحطوهين اي كانوا دو فحنان شباق الحيوبين لو تعالى نسيونو يلو فاصون بيشو ميتو ديرو خيم الكوثو حينو تشبحتو العولم عولمين امين Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you.